heinous, despicable, fucking insane. Friends, I've got two stories today that are going to make you sick. We start with the tragic life of Kirill Matthews. He was based in Thornton Heath, which is a part of South London. I'm on service and wanted to like and help you with today. Um, basically, Kirill, he's been acting really funny, like his body's floppy and his eyes is rolling back and his chest is like coming out like he can't breathe and he's not responding properly. Okay, so he's, is he awake at the moment? Yeah, but it's like he'll be laying down and then he lashes out and then he's just not, he looks like he's not here basically. His eyes are just oh. rolling back. Based upon that information that you have just given me there, but it's advised I do arrange an emergency ambulance. He suffered 41 rib fractures and it was also said that he had internal bleeding which came from a 4 inch cut in his liver. Now his life was unfortunately taken on the 20th of October 2019. It was said around that time when the doctors looked at him that he suffered days, weeks of abuse, most of it non-fatal. The doctor claimed that these fractures came from some kind of twisting motion, so maybe he was thrown or maybe he fell. And then they also said that this cut in his liver came from a kick or a blow or a punch or something of that nature. Now Felicia Shirley is Kirill's mother. She's 24 years old or at the time she was 24. She worked for the children's services at Croydon Council. She admitted to the police that she allowed her son to come to harm but she didn't take his life. Her then partner, Kemar Brown, who had been in jail many times for many violent altercations, he denied touching the boy. It's claimed that when Kemar was in court, his lawyer argued on his behalf that, well, Fishilia, she called 999, right? She asked for an ambulance and they allegedly told her, compress his chest, but they told her, compress it with two hands rather than one and Kimar's lawyer was trying to argue that well this is what caused his life to be taken. But during the case experts told the jury that in the history of British cases and law there had never been anyone that died from a damaged liver where they were given CPR. Now the court heard multiple phone recordings where Fischelia and Kima was striking Kirel. The audio had been secretly recorded by Shirley because she thought Kima was cheating on her. Kirel, who was described as a happy and fun child, would have expressed the pain he was suffering in the final days of his life, even though he could not speak, the jury heard. A jury deliberated for over three days and then eventually found Kimar Brown guilty of the, Kirill's death. Shirley herself, she was actually acquitted of murder but she was found guilty of manslaughter. Now the actual sentencing has been delayed until March the 25th so we'll wait on how long they will get. Now what's crazy about this is prior to this incident in October, the police had been called to the residences many times, you know, uh, domestic disturbances but according to the police at that time, Kirill was safe and well. The police were allegedly told prior to October in July 2019 that a passerby heard loud noises from the apartment and these noises were saying stop hitting my face. It turns out this was Shirley telling Kimar to stop hitting her. In May 2019 it was reported that Kirill actually spent five days in hospital because he had a really bad bruise on the side of his face. And then at the time the hospital asked Shirley what happened, she said well he fell on the side of his face and it was an accident. Kimar Brown himself had been convicted for robbery, battery, having a knife, drugs and resisting arrest. He also was subject to a non-molestation order from a former partner. It was also said that as they were taking care of Karel, the more and more they took care of him, the more and more isolated they became from their extended family. This part says to me that whatever was going on in their head, they were taking it out on Karel, right? But they decided, well, we don't want anyone visiting him because if they see his face, if we see the marks on his body, by chance, they're going to be like, what is going on? So they decided themselves to distance themselves from anyone that they knew so then nobody could ever see Karel. If you're with your friends, they're going to ask you, how's your son doing? How's your sister doing? How's your brother doing? How's your daughter doing? These are normal questions we ask people. And I believe the reason why they pushed everyone else away 
and why they remained isolated was to avoid being exposed. What's also interesting is when the police were listening to multiple audio files, one of them, they heard Kima. He again was unleashing punishment onto Kirel. And he said to Kirel, you have spoiled the fun. This tells me that Kirel to them was an inconvenience. This tells me that Kima just didn't want to take care of it. He just could not be bothered to deal with it. He wanted to live his life, sell his drugs, take his drugs, continue on with his life of aggression and crime and whatever fucking anger he had. But what got in the way of that was this little boy. Now, as I've mentioned, the case is still ongoing, but it doesn't fucking matter. Who the fuck do you think you are treating this little boy that way? You're not special. So what? If he was an inconvenience, you chose this life, Kima, you dumb motherfucker. You chose to be with her. All you had to do was walk away. I know it's hard walking away from kids. And I hate saying that in this context because it kind of feels like I'm giving him a reprieve. I'm not. But if it's the choice between the kid surviving and you leaving or you staying and the kid potentially having his life taken, you brother, get the fuck out. These cases really, really anger me because you guys know I'm a father myself. I love my son so much. One of the reasons why I pursued YouTube and TikTok is so I don't need to wake up every day and be at some office for eight hours and come home. Those eight hours I want to spend with him. I want to raise him. I want to nurture him. I want to teach him. But I also want that hard drive in my mind to record every single day I spend with him. From the moment he was born to him growing up, taking his first meal, saying his first words, watching him walk for the first time. I remember it all. I've got it all documented. That is what kids do to you. That's what children do to you. And this sick, twisted, lonely, dumb motherfucker, Kima Brown, deserves nothing but to be in a hole for the rest of his life. We now move on to the story of Christy Alcazar. This is a recent case. It just happened in December 2021. So it's still ongoing. She either has been charged or she's about to be charged. But she took the life of her baby. On the night of December the 3rd, 2021, Christy was arrested. And when the police went into her house, they saw the five-month-old baby with multiple wounds to the chest. The neighbor told police that she lived next to Christy for so many years and this completely shocked her. It was said that when the police got to the house, Christy was arguing with her mom and her mother was screaming. Now when the police asked Christy why did you do this, she said this was to fulfill the last of her sins. Now as this case is still ongoing and is kind of fresh, there's not much inf information on her motivations. But it's pretty clear to me that given that this baby girl was only five months old, then Christy must have been suffering postpartum depression. Now, there's no excusing what she did. What she did was messed up. I think you can all agree. But I do also understand the significance of postpartum depression and how having a lack of support system can exacerbate the effects of postpartum depression. So I'm not going to go into the mind on why she did this. I'm not really going to call her out because I'm not a woman and I don't really understand the post birth effects, if you know what I'm saying. It was also reported by the police that when they questioned Christy further, she said that she had no remorse. She didn't regret it. And if she could go back in time, she would not change a thing. Now, what gets me about both these cases is we've heard it. We've seen it so many times. The police said, well, we went there before and we didn't think there was an issue. Right. There's always whenever events like this happen, more often than not, there's always a lead up of events. There's always A, B, C, D happens. Then it jumps to Z. Right. So in the case of Kirel, there was domestic disturbances in the household before he actually died. And I think to myself time and time and time again, the social services, the local government agencies let these children down. 
Now you could make the argument that one took place in London, this one with Christie took place in New Jersey. You could make the argument, well this is one isolated incident and this is one isolated incident and these are different agencies and for every 1000 kid they save, right, this could be that one kid that just, you know, fell through the cracks. One life is more precious than anything else. One child's life is as precious as the 100,000 that you saved. So whilst the child protection services or whoever it may be in different countries more often than not do a good job, well, given the nature of their job, they need to be held accountable even for one child. Now in the case of Christy, like I said, she suffered from postpartum depression. So I'm just gonna leave it as it is. And for the females watching me, you can decide or you can let me know what your thoughts are. Because I know it's quite a sensitive issue and as a man I'm never going to understand it so it would be insincere of me to give some kind of psychological analysis. But in the case of Kemar Brown, this fucking idiot whose ass needs to be sewed up continuously and then we just need to keep feeding him and feeding him. That's what you do to people like Kemar. But at this point I'm just ranting and raving so why don't you guys comment tell me what you think.